Hi before, so who knows who will show up, but this is going to be a D.B. Cooper video about Richard Floyd McCoy. And I promise the next live video I do will be a Zodiac Killer inspired. Look at this thing. This is why you don't go live and stuff, stuff like this. But anyway, uh, there's a lot of D.B. Cooper people know. Dan Greider, a pilot and a parachutist, has a YouTube channel. And he did a, just did a long D.B. Cooper video just yesterday. Uh, you know, really, really good, well-produced video about who he believes D.B. Cooper was. And that is a gentleman by the name of Richard Floyd McCoy Jr. And he's been a suspect in the D.B. Cooper case for a long, long time because he pulled off a similar uh, skyjacking as did D.B. Cooper did just about five months after the D.B. Cooper skyjacking in April of 1972 was Richard Floyd McCoy's uh, skyjacking. And of course, D.B. Cooper's was on Thanksgiving Eve of 1971. So, um, like I said, Dan Greider, good guy. I mean, he, uh, pilot, parachutist, two things that I'm definitely not, um, more of a researcher. And of course I have a, a, a horse in this race. I have a suspect by the name of Ted B. Braden, which is the focus of my book, Paratrooper of Fortune. Um, but I think, uh, Greider did a good, a good job in, uh, you know, forwarding the case for Richard Floyd McCoy. And the big reveal he had was that recently Richard Floyd McCoy's Two children, he had a son and a daughter, came forward and said that Richard Floyd McCoy was not home on Thanksgiving Eve of 1971, meaning it's very possible that he was D.B. Cooper because, uh, you know, they said that he had an alibi for that day, and then apparently that alibi is not as good as people thought because now his children are saying, now that their mother uh, had passed away, she died about a year ago, I think uh, a year ago, December, and now they can talk about this because she's not at threat of any more legal jeopardy or something like that because she's deceased. You're not gonna, you can't throw her in jail now. So um, Grider got them to come forward and basically say they, they feel that their father was D.B. Cooper. I mean, obviously they know that he pulled off another skyjacking. Richard McCoy pulled that off. Um, he got in a shootout with the FBI. He wound up getting killed in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And the rest is history. So... All that being said, they didn't really offer any substantial proof. They didn't produce a plane ticket. They didn't produce one of the $20 bills that, that are still out there and missing. Of course, we know that only $5,800 was recovered from the, the D.B. Cooper heist back in 1980 by uh, eight-year-old Brian Ingram. I actually got the message with Brian yesterday about a lot of cool stuff that I reminded him of that he didn't even know about. So I thought that was kind of nice for me as a D.B. Cooper researcher to get to... Uh, to um, get Brian to uh, actually took some pictures of some stuff from his own collection and back from when he found that money in 1980. So that was really neat. But all that being said, uh, you know, there's been different confessions to who D.B. Cooper was. Uh, Joe Weber said her husband, Dwayne, confessed to her that he was D.B. Cooper. Of course, Marla Cooper's pretty well known in this case. Her uncle, L.D. Cooper, uh, had a great story. And she came forward and said that, you know, he had an interesting thing hanging that happened when she was there for Thanksgiving back uh in 71 or he was bloodied up with his with his brother or other uncle i think or you know something like that but there's been many confessions and stuff like that but this one's interesting because it's mccoy's two children now and uh i think their sister-in-law and i think the babysitter even even so uh you know it's pretty interesting because it's multiple people but uh of course like i said i have a dog and a, a pony in the race which is not richard floyd mccoy but i wanted to read from my book paratrooper of fortune just to get some facts out there because one thing that i do do is my suspect has two or three negatives and if you've seen my videos on him i put them out there first with ted braden one he's not the optimal height for db cooper two he didn't have brown eyes he had hazel eyes which could change with the different lighting conditions and uh but db cooper was said to have brown eyes and that all comes from uh florence schaffner she's the only one that saw cooper before he put his sunglasses on for most of the uh for the plane flight but uh i think Grider would have done himself some favors to at least put the negatives out there before uh, you know, he got into the good stuff on Richard Floyd McCoy. One is that, of course, when Richard Floyd McCoy did his uh, skyjacking in April of 72, of course, they considered him as a D.B. Cooper suspect. So they got all plenty of his photos in front of the entire flight crew uh, of the D.B. Cooper flight and some of the other passengers. And they all ruled him out immediately. They said, no, that's not him. You know, uh, Florence Schaffner, Tina Mucklow, they all looked at pictures of Richard Floyd McCoy. And this is just six months after, or five, you know, that they looked at these pictures um, after the D.B. Cooper event. So it was somewhat still fresh in their minds. It hadn't been multiple years. It had only been six months. And they all ruled him out. Uh, you know, Dan should have at least brought that up. If he has this compelling stuff from the children, uh, at least get the negatives out there, okay? Uh, that's all I'm saying. But anyway, 
reading from my book, Paratrooper of Fortune, which I give a, a really nice breakdown of all the suspects. And uh, this starts out, I'm going to read from the book because it makes it easier for me and it's live, remember. It says, another Vietnam veteran who has had a long tenure as a top-tier D.B. Cooper suspect is Richard Floyd McCoy Jr. McCoy made his claim to fame after bailing out of a Boeing 727 over his home state of Utah with $500,000 in cash on April 7, 1972, just a few months after the Cooper jump, like I said. McCoy was born in Kinston, North Carolina on December 7, 1942 to Richard Floyd McCoy Sr., a World War II veteran, and Myrtle Helen McCoy. Richard's parents were first cousins, that's true, which may have resulted in some teasing of young Richard by anyone who had known this fact. Another characteristic that would cause young McCoy to be teased was his lisp. This is going to be important later. Resulting from an operation during which the skin flap under his tongue that is connected to the floor of the mouth was cut because it had been too taut. That, that skin under his tongue was so tight that he, they had to have it surgically removed. So that resulted in uh, Richard Floyd McCoy Jr. having a lisp. And remember, uh, Tina Mucklow sat by D.B. Cooper for about two and a half hours and she never reported that Cooper had a lisp. Another thing, and I'll bring this up, is Richard Floyd McCoy was from fairly rural North Carolina. He went to school in Raleigh, North Carolina High School. And uh, he had a North Carolina accent his whole life. I mean, even when he died, he had a North Carolina accent with a lisp. Nobody reported that in D.B. Cooper. And, of course, no one's talking about that. They're only talking about his, his kids now. But anyway, regardless of the relative hardships of his childhood, McCoy did grow up from grow up and become a decorated and highly regarded soldier. At the time of his successful skyjacking, Richard McCoy Jr. was a 29-year-old veteran who had served two tours in Vietnam. Here's a picture. And McCoy was a Green Beret, by the way, for a short period. He did two terms in Nam. He did about four months as a Green Beret, a pretty short term with the Green Berets. But he was Special Forces, unlike a lot of suspects in D.B. Cooper Land that claimed to be it have been Special Forces, not naming names. Rackstraw in Vietnam, not Special Forces. Okay. During McCoy's first tour in 1964, he trained as a parachutist and demolition expert and was awarded the Purple Heart. After completion of this tour, McCoy returned to Vietnam as a combat helicopter pilot. In 1967, he was awarded the Army Commendation Medal for Heroism. I had read on a military site that McCoy was possibly never a member of Special Forces, so I had, re I had research carried out that proved that he was a member of the 5th Special Forces during his first tour in Vietnam. A former Special Forces soldier, who will be called Larry, that, that gets important with me later too, who has written several books and has kept extensive files on all Special Forces soldiers that were active duty in Vietnam, informed me that SP4 Richard F. McCoy Jr. was uh, temporarily detached from duty from 5th Group to Tan Fu from 564-11 to uh, 11-64 as a combat engineer demo on Captain Thomas Blagg's team. And uh, it was just that exact record for Mr. Fort McCoy. I know some people, even Darren Schaefer, wasn't even sure that he was a Green Beret. I heard the other day, and Darren knows everything about D.B. Cooper. And uh, now he knows a little more if you're watching, Darren. So in 1968, McCoy was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. As stated in the original citation, as posted on MilitaryTimes.com in their Hall of Valor project, Warrant Officer McCoy distinguished himself with exceptionally of valorous actions during the early morning hours of 8 November 1967 while serving as a helicopter pilot with the Air Cavalry Troop 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment in the air over a Vietnamese popular forces compound at Zay Du Can, seven miles northwest of Tran Linh, Vietnam. Upon hearing that the compound was in the process of being overrun by a large Viet Cong force, Warrant Officer McCoy volunteered to fly his aircraft to the scene in support of the friendly forces in spite of poor visibility due to thick ground fog and intermittent cloud layers and a complete lack of tactical maps of the area. Flying by instrumentation and radio alone, Warrant Officer McCoy located the compound and came under automatic weapons and small arms fire. With the position of the compound marketed by a flare and the firefight marked by tracer rounds, Warrant Officer McCoy began a series of firing passes, launching rockets directly into the Viet Cong positions until all his, all his ammunition was expended. Due to his courageous flight and highly accurate fire, the enemy was completely routed, leaving 20 bodies behind. 
Warrant Officer McCoy's outstanding flying ability and devotion to duty are in keeping with the highest traditions of the military service and reflect great credit upon himself, his unit, and the United States Army. So that was an extraordinarily brave action that Richard McCoy, Richard Floyd McCoy pulled off while in Vietnam. It's, it's really important to know uh, regarding uh, his, his, uh, his own skyjacking that he did in April of 72. And then goes on. After his second tour in Vietnam, Richard, um, Richard McCoy, a devout Mormon, returned to his home in Provo, Utah, where he lived with his wife and two young children. McCoy pleaded with his wife to permit him to do one more tour in Vietnam, and she flat out refused. McCoy then volunteered in the Utah National Guard and took up skydiving as a hobby. McCoy also taught Mormon Sunday School and went back to Brigham Young University, BYU, to study law enforcement. That's kind of ironic. While studying at BYU, he became interested in various hijackings that were occurring at the time, most of which were carried out by hijackers who were taking advantage of the tense relations between the United States and Cuba, attempting to extort money or claim political asylum. McCoy would even write a thesis at BYU about how hijackings could be prevented. Now, that's funny. Uh, when D.B. Cooper jumped on Thanksgiving Eve of 1971 and extorted $200,000 for himself, parachuting, parachuting out of a Boeing 727 mid-flight, Richard McCoy no doubt took notice. As he was struggling to support his family on a small income from the GI Bill, the temptation to pull off a high similar to D.B. Cooper's was too much to resist for the well-trained and broke Vietnam veteran. At the time of the D.B. Cooper hijacking, McCoy told an acquaintance that he would have demanded a $500,000 ransom, not a mere $200,000 ransom as Cooper did. And Richard McCoy stated, uh, started planning on doing just that. On the morning of April 7th, 1972, McCoy was driven by his wife to the airport. She would later claim that she didn't think he would go through with it. And this is all cited from a, an article from uh, Scott, uh, Parachutist Magazine that was written by a, name, a lady named Mushika Farnsworth. You should look at that. If you're really interested in McCoy, read that entire article and then come back and tell me that he was D.B. Cooper. He got on a plane from Utah to the Denver airport where he almost missed his connecting flight. First almost big mistake by McCoy. It was United Airlines Flight 855 due to a snowstorm in Chicago resulting in delays at other airports. McCoy finally made it to the ticket counter and purchased a ticket to Los Angeles under the name James Johnson. As so meticulously detailed in an article for Parachutist Magazine titled Skyjacker, the Richard McCoy Jr. Story by Musika Farnsworth, published on March 11, 2011, McCoy's skyjacking did not play out the way that D.B. Cooper's did. Remember that. They're polar opposites, and this lady does the best job of laying that out. McCoy did a lot of preparation for his crime. He brought with him an envelope containing typewritten instructions for the hijacking and a few carry-on bags in which, in which were stuffed a parachute, helmet, jumpsuit, makeup kit, and disguise. But his caper got off to an inauspicious start when he almost missed the flight he intended to hijack. First, almost huge mistake by McCoy. Once on board the aircraft, McCoy went into the bathroom to change his appearance. On went makeup, a wig which worked to cover his big ears, but which also caused black hair dye to streak down his face, mirrored sunglasses and gloves to leave no fingerprints, and off went his conservative brown suit replaced by loud hippie-style clothes. So McCoy had the whole, the whole gamut. He had makeup, he had, to, he had to change clothes to look different. I mean, he, he, he did all this crazy stuff that immediately drew attention to himself. While in the bathroom, McCoy heard an announcement asking if anyone had lost a manila envelope. The lost envelope was his unsealed envelope of hijacking instructions. Miraculously for McCoy, nobody bothered to look inside the envelope and he was able to get, back, get it back by opening the bathroom door and gesturing to the stewardess that the envelope was his. So this dude left his typewritten hijack instructions that his wife had typed for him in the waiting area. He's already gotten on the plane and he left the critical hijack instructions back in the waiting area. That's Stevie Cooper? No, sorry. McCoy got his envelope back, but he took so much time in the bathroom that the flight's second officer had to order him to come out and take his seat so the plane could take off. 
Once McCoy was finally seated, he realized that the crew members on the flight had been on the flight he had taken into Denver and that he was actually on the same plane in the same seat that he had been on earlier in the day. This meant that his fingerprints were already on the plane. Another huge strike against this guy. I mean, that's T.B. Cooper? Got it. Uh, McCoy had been acting rather suspiciously, and this did not go unnoticed. In fact, the captain found McCoy's action so suspect that he decided to land in Grand Junction, Colorado, where FBI agents were waiting. The passenger sitting beside McCoy also found him suspicious, especially when he turned to one of them, stuck a 45 caliber pistol into his chest, and handed him an index card that read, This is a hijack. Move forward and get a stewardess. A stewardess was summoned, and McCoy handed her a 45 caliber cartridge, a hand grenade pen, and an envelope of instructions on which was written, Grenade Pen pull, Pulled. Pistol Loaded. As you can see, when compared to the D.B. Cooper skyjacking, the McCoy episode was a complete and utter mess. McCoy's own nervousness, uh, nervous actions almost led to his being caught before he even made his first move. His terrible disguise also called immediate attention to himself. See, on the D.B. Cooper flight, no, none of the passengers even knew it was being hijacked till they got off the plane in Seattle. Not one passenger knew the plane was being hijacked that was with D.B. Cooper. And this guy's already made a, a spectacle of himself and half the plane already knows it's being hijacked. See the difference? You get better as you do something a second time, not worse. Although McCoy was successful in the initial skyjacking, he would encounter numerous problems in bringing his entire plan to fruition. After the captain announced the plane would be making an unscheduled landing for repairs, many of the passengers figured out that the plane was being hijacked and became frightened. After McCoy's loot, uh, loot and parachutes were finally brought on board after the unscheduled landing and an excruciating two and a half hour wait, he had the daunting task of evacuating the 85 passengers on board. McCoy knew that during this process, federal agents could sneak on board to take him out. McCoy became distracted by the process of disembarking the passengers and forgot to ask for one of his hijack instruction notes back. Remember, D.B. Cooper methodically asked for every note back that, that he gave and that uh, Tina Mucklow wrote down, or, there, or Florence Shabner wrote down. He got all the notes back. McCoy already left one after leaving his skyjack instructions in the waiting area? This is D.B. Cooper? Okay, Dan. Another unfortunate incident happened just after takeoff from San Francisco when a sport parachute rig that McCoy had taken on the plane suddenly popped out of its spring-loaded pilot chute, hitting a stewardess and almost knocking her out. He brought his own parachute, that's smart, but it deployed on the plane and almost knocked out the stewardess. You can't make this up. This is all documented true stuff. This isn't made up. This is all documented. McCoy had no idea why this happened. McCoy was now forced into using the parachute rigs that were supplied by the FBI, which he had planned not to use, fearing that they would be bugged with the transmitter. As the captain continued to fly the plane per McCoy's instructions, McCoy sent the stewardess back to the cockpit while he struggled to put on his white shirt and brown slacks. He would also shave off his mustache and sideburns, pull a jumpsuit on over his clothes, and put on his jump boots and helmet. The time was almost midnight and the sky was black. Carrying the failed parachute rig, an unloaded 45 pistol, and a fake hand grenade, McCoy, with a 70-pound money bag between his legs, finally made his leap into destiny. After hitching a ride, McCoy made it home relatively unscathed. Got away with the money. After the plane safely landed, it was searched by the FBI who collected any items McCoy may have touched, including a magazine that had his clear fingerprint on the cover, and most importantly, the note written in his own hand that he forgot to get back. Obviously, McCoy was not as organized as D.B. Cooper. Ironically, the next day, McCoy was on National Guard duty flying a helicopter to search for the Skyjacker, who was, of course, him. Now, that's funny, and I know Darren Schaefer loves pointing that out, that Richard Floyd McCoy was flying a helicopter looking for himself. That's funny. The search for the yet unnamed hijacker turned up a lead. A motorist reported picking up a hitchhiker wearing a jumpsuit and carrying a duffel bag at a roadside hamburger stand outside of Provo, Utah. The FBI took a photograph of McCoy to the restaurant where an employee recognized him and said that she'd sold him a milkshake the night of the hijacking, sometime before midnight. McCoy actually used part of his stolen loot to pay for the milkshake. Uh, what became... 
McCoy's undoing was described in an article that appeared in the St. Joseph Gazette in the April 10, 1972 edition. The article was titled, Casual Conversation by McCoy with Trooper Was Arrest Clue. The article stated, The tip which led agents to McCoy was provided by Robert Van Iperin. I might be spelling that wrong. I mean, pronouncing that wrong. A close acquaintance of the suspect who is a Utah Highway Patrolman living in Salt Lake City. Approximately three weeks ago, McCoy told Iperin it would be possible for someone to hijack a plane and get away with it by carrying his own parachute on the plane, and then if he were to hijack a plane, he would demand at least $500,000. The highway patrolman also told FBI investigators that McCoy's sister-in-law, who was not identified by name, telephoned him at approximately 9.30 p.m. last Friday. While the hijacking was in progress, she asked if McCoy was on a mission of some sort. About two hours later, some uh, some 15 minutes after the hijacker bailed out with half a million dollars in ransom over Provo, the sister-in-law phoned Iperin again. The complaint said she told him McCoy was not home and that she was scared to death as McCoy had tried to get her to help him plan on a hijacking. After the trip from Iperin, McCoy was brought in for questioning. He denied that he had anything to do with the hijacking and voluntarily gave police a sample of his writing. The Department of the Army was also happy to help, supplying McCoy's fingerprints, as well as three sample of his, samples of his handwriting, which they had on file. All three handwriting samples matched the hijacker's instruction note. He didn't even try to disguise his handwriting. And the fingerprint on the cover of the Mainliner magazine matched the print that the Army had on file. This is a master criminal, folks. This is D.B. Cooper, all right, the master criminal, Richard Floyd McCoy. I mean, nothing about this skyjacking is similar to D.B. Cooper if you read the D.B. Cooper files. Nothing. Uh, if this guy turned out to be D.B. Cooper, I, I don't know. I'm going to eat this phone that I'm, I'm shooting this on. McCoy claimed innocent but was convicted and received a 45-year sentence. Once incarcerated, using his access to the prison's dental office, McCoy fashioned a fake handgun out of molding material used by dentists. He and a crew of convicts escaped uh, in August 1974 by stealing a garbage truck and crashing it through the prison's main gate. It took three months before the FBI lo uh, located McCoy in Virginia. McCoy shot at FBI agents attempting to arrest him, and Agent Nicholas O'Hara fired back with a shotgun, killing McCoy. In 1991, Bernie Rhodes and a former FBI agent, Russell Calamay, co-authored D.B. Cooper, The Real McCoy, in which they claimed that Cooper and McCoy were really the same person, citing that both men carried out similar skyjackings and that McCoy owned a tie and mother-of-pearl tie clip, both similar to those left on the plane by Cooper. The strongest pieces of evidence presented in the book were gas receipts on McCoy's credit card, one receipt from a gas station located on the I-15 route from Provo to Las Vegas, about 200 miles north of Las Vegas, dated early morning on the day of the Cooper skyjacking, and another gas receipt from a Las Vegas service station dated the day after the Cooper jump. In addition, the authors discovered a record of a phone call made on Thanksgiving night from the Tropicana Hotel in Las Vegas to McCoy's residence in Provo. Their theory was that McCoy flew out of Las Vegas to Portland on the day of the Cooper skyjacking and somehow made his way back to Las Vegas the next day. Due to McCoy's being a Mormon, it is unusual that he would have been in Las Vegas. Neither Rhodes or Calame were involved in the original Cooper investigation, but Calame was the head of the Utah FBI office that investigated McCoy and eventually arrested him for the copycat hijacking that occurred in April 1972. According to the authors of D.B. Cooper, The Real McCoy, McCoy never admitted nor denied he was D.B. Cooper. When McCoy was directly asked whether he was Cooper, he replied, I don't want to talk to you about it. The agent who killed McCoy is quoted as saying, when I shot Richard McCoy, I shot D.B. Cooper at the same time. That's a famous quote. The widow of Richard McCoy, Karen Burns McCoy, reached a legal settlement with the book's co-authors and its publishers. McCoy's family still insists McCoy was not D.B. Cooper. Well, of course, that's changed now because now his children are saying that he was, or at least he wasn't around on Thanksgiving uh, of 1971. To summarize some of the main points of McCoy's hijacking, McCoy left his hijacking instructions that were, that were in an unsealed envelope that reportedly had hijack instru instructions written on it and included, a single, and included a single bullet and a grenade pin in the waiting area. McCoy reclaimed the envelope after an airline agent brought it onto the plane asking if anyone had left it behind. 
McCoy's makeup and entire disguise was an unmitigated disaster that called undue attention to himself. The parachute pack McCoy brought on the plane deployed prematurely. These are all known facts. McCoy accidentally left a note with his handwriting on it with the stewardess. Fact. McCoy left a perfectly clear fingerprint on a magazine that he had read on his flight. McCoy talked with a lisp. No, no witness reported that D.B. Cooper had a lisp. And remember, he had a North Carolina accent, too. The entire hijacking took far longer than McCoy had anticipated. And best of all, McCoy bragged to a police officer buddy about how a skyjacking crime could be carried out, even stating how much money he would demand. This is a fact. I would leave out the part where he asked his chatting sister-in-law to help him, but I can't resist. No one who gave a description of D.B. Cooper described him as having big ears or wearing any makeup. That's, that's just true. Furthermore, McCoy was 29 years old at the time of the Cooper skyjacking and not in his mid-40s. Most witnesses describe Cooper's age as mid-40s. And I will give it to McCoy. He looked, he looked older than his age during the skyjacking. But Tina Mucklow, I think, was 23 at that time, and she didn't notice... Uh, you know, she thought that Cooper was middle-aged. I mean, you think even if McCoy looked older for his age, he's still going to kind of come off as somebody that's only five or so years older than her? I don't know. It's painfully obvious that McCoy is not the real man who made no mistakes and acted as cool as the flip side of a pillow on Thanksgiving Eve in 1971 and managed to get away with it. So that's that's my section on Richard Floyd McCoy. I mean, I was in a, uh, the D.B. Cooper uh, Facebook group earlier. When Eric Eulis did a, did a video on, on it with someone in... Uh, he mentioned that, you know, what is this stuff about improving on the skyjacking when McCoy did his? Uh, D.B. Cooper made no mistakes. So how did anything Richard McCoy do improve on D.B. Cooper? There's not, okay? Um, so that's it. That's from my book. So uh, regardless of who's saying what, where's a ticket? Where's a 20? That's all I got to say, you know? I mean, you know, some of these claims are cheap. But, uh, you know, I'll check out some of the comments. If you left them, I saw some scrolling by, but I had to read that. But uh, thanks for tuning in and uh, catch everybody next time. Thanks.